Man, the Lord is good. I am so grateful to be here today. It's look at it. It cleared up just just in time. Uh, man, it's it, it it's a good day to be in the house of the Lord. It is a good day to be in the house of the Lord. I I'm praying because I don't know if I've ever had this happen to me before, but I came to church this morning with not one message, but two messages, and I'm like, which one am I going to preach? My husband was like, he was like, you know, he's he, he's a little bit more perfectionist than I am in a lot of a lot of things. People don't realize that. Like, if you guys come to our house, it is my man who decides what colors go on the wall, what couch we have, our carpet. You know, that's usually a thing that us ladies do. But I don't care as long as it looks right. I don't feel like doing it. So I was like, I got two messages. He's like, that means I got to get two powerpoints together. I was like, we don't need a powerpoint. It doesn't matter. I just get up there and preach. And he was like, no. <laughs> We need a PowerPoint. So the poor man put together two PowerPoints for me, and I still am up here like, okay, Lord, which one am I supposed to share? So I decided we're going to stay here for two hours, and I'm going to preach them both. Just kidding. <laughs> Aunt Margaret's deaf staring me right now, and I'm just kidding. <laughs> just kidding. She wasn't even looking at me. But listen, <laughs> they're like, I will watch it in the car on the way home on uh, Facebook. Well, the Lord is good. Let's let let me pray again. I just I, I need discernment on which one I'm supposed to share today. So, Father God, I just thank you. I thank you that your word is powerful and effective. God, that your word will accomplish what it sets out to do. God, I thank you that your word is still living and breathing today. God, I pray your word would live and breathe in our hearts and in our lives. God, I pray the word that is preached today would breathe life into our very soul and spirit. God, it would divide the fleshly man from the spirit man, the carnal mind from the spirit mind. God, that you would divide the, what is wrong from what is right. God, today that you would raise up discernment in the house of the Lord. God, today that you would minister to us, Lord Jesus, that we would leave this place with our heads a little higher, not because of who we are, but because of who you are, Jesus, because we're still on the potter's wheel, because what you began in us, you are still bringing to completion until the day we stand before you, Lord Jesus. God, I pray today you would strengthen your church, Lord God. You would encourage your body that you are still moving, that you are still God, that you are that your word is still powerful, that you still love your children. God, I thank you today, Lord God, that you would that you would strengthen weary knees, Lord God, that we would once again pray and intercede. God, not just when we feel like it, not just when the atmosphere is right, Lord God, but that we would be carriers of your presence in the house today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right. Well, the Lord is good. Today, I'm going to be speaking on self-control. <laughs> you know what was going to be that one? Yeah, self-control. We're going to talk about self-control today. My least favorite fruit of the Spirit. I pick it like every other. That one, impatience, I don't know. I go back and forth, which one is the hardest for me. But we're going to talk about self-control today. And I believe that this is a word for, from the Lord to his body. We're going to go ahead and we're going to um, open up the Bible and the book of Galatians. If you want to pull that, that out. And we're going to go where it talks about the fruit of the spirit in, in verse 5. I'm going to read just 5, 22 and 23. And I'm going to read it in two different translations. I'm going to read it in the NIV 1984 translation. My favorite. You can't even hardly find that one online anymore. Thank God I have an old school Bible. And then we're going to read it in the good old fashioned KJV, okay? It says this in the NIV. But the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, hallelujah, peace. Yes, Lord. Oh, it starts so good. Patience. Whew, Lord. Kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Can you say self-control? Against such things, there is no law. Hmm. 
Here we go, and we're going to read again, same verses, but in the, the King James Version. And it says this, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such things, there is no law. I'll give you a little um, nerd tip over here. On if you want to have a better understanding of what the scripture says, always read more than one translation. If you're doing a word study, it's very good. There's a, um, an app, I believe. I have it as an app, but it's a website, too, called, called Bible Hub. And you could put in one verse, and it pulls up, like, all kinds of translations. Do you know how hard it was when I first got saved? We would have to, like, bust out all kinds of Bibles and concordance, and it would take up the whole dining room table. Like, seriously, y'all, it's so easy now to study the Word of God, although you can't believe everything you read um, on the Internet. You need to get credible sources, okay? And I still believe in a good old-fashioned Matthew Henry's concordance. But anyway, this I like to do because so often we may not get the full definition and the full meaning of what God is trying to teach us. And when it comes to self-control, I like what the uh, Merriam-Webster Dictionary says. It says, restraint exercise over one's impulses, emotions, or desires. Woo! Restraint. Say restraint. Okay, we're going to go to my favorite devotional book. If you never get a devotional book in your life, get this one. And if you don't have it, what are you waiting for? Sparkling Gems from the Greek. Okay, get it. The first volume. Second volume is good too. First volume, you just can't beat it. Mine is so tore up, is as tore up as my 1984 NIV Bible, and I literally have duct tape on it. Like, <laughs> literally have duct tape on it. But it breaks down one verse in the New Testament and breaks it down in its original language, the Greek. I had someone send me a video this week uh, of somebody preaching. They had lots of uh, titles in front of their name. What they were preaching was completely whack in my opinion. But I, I watched the video, and I told them, and the most kindest way I possibly could tell them, you cannot get your theology off of TikTok, friends. <laughs> you cannot build a theology off a two-minute clip on TikTok. People are saying all kinds of things. And they're like, well, what if, you know, they've changed the translations and, and we've missed the original. I, I said, well, if you really want to know, if, you, if you're really concerned about that, go to a Greek and Hebrew linear Bible and you can go back to the original language. The New Testament was written in Greek and then translated into Latin and then translated into many um, different translations. And so there's all these debates on what's the best. And I'm like, read multiple ones and go back to the original language. Why I like the sparkling gems from the Greek is because you can go to the original language. And this, uh, the guy, Rick Rayner, who wrote the devotion um, is actually... Um, has a lot, a lot of knowledge on the Greek language, and so he really breaks it down. So according to my devotional, uh, Sparkling Gems, self-control or temperance. You notice in the NIV it says self-control, and the KJV it says temperance. So self-control or temperance, it comes from, from uh, the word, I'm going to spell it for you because I cannot say it. It's E-N-C-R-A-T-O-S. And the E-N in Greek just means N. And the C R A T O S. You want to give that a try? What you, how you would pronounce it? Kratos? Probably not, but that's what I'm going to say. Um, <laughs> is the Greek word for power? When compound, uh, when you compound these two words together into one word, what what it means is control and denotes the power over one's self. Hence, it's often translated self control. It suggests controlling or restraining one's passions, appetite, and desire. Ooh, guys, that's deep. The person with temperance or self-control has power over his appetites, physical urges, passions, and desires. I remember when uh, my husband um, had an opportunity after we were married for, for some time, probably at least five, maybe ten years, he, he went out with... Um, his father, and they went hunting, and uh, he doesn't he doesn't get to see his dad all that often, and so this was a special time, and and they were talking about urges that 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 men can have, and basically his dad excused a lot of 
behavior that was unsanctified in, in his grown up years by saying some things men, talking about the male species, just can't control. And then my husband looks to him and said, I'm a man just like you. And I disagree with that because through the Holy Spirit, he gives us self-control. And this is the thing. Sometimes we listen to the teachings of the world and say, well, that's just a natural desire. or That's just that's that's normal. That's and, and, and it may be normal. And it may be natural, but friends, when we are born again, we are called to the supernatural. And we've got to stop making excuses and just saying, oh, well, this is just this is just a natural thing. This is just normal because that is an excuse that we make that and frankly, to justify our bad behavior. And so through the Holy Spirit, we can produce temperance, which is self-control in our lives. And we can say no to overeating, even if we're carnivals, <laughs> right? We can still say no, and it is not easy. We can say no to overindulging in fleshly activities. We can say no to any access of the physical realm. Self-control teaches us to say no to what we want. There is a thing that, that is always interesting to me, that Often people who struggle with self-control have control issues, meaning that they try to control other people, but they have a very difficult time controlling themselves. And this is the thing, friends. The re that, that is like a misguided direction of what you're supposed to do with control. Because any control uh, that is aimed towards controlling other people versus controlling yourself is manipulation and it is rooted in witchcraft. But controlling yourself is a fruit of the spirit that is only developed through the Holy Spirit. It is temperance. It's learning to live in moderation. It's learning balance. It is learning that everything that is permissible is not beneficial and it is used to control yourself the hardest person you will ever lead is yourself but so often instead of focusing on ourselves we take all that focus that we should be disciplining ourselves and try to control other people and we find ourselves frustrated and feeling miserable because as much as I want to control how my children do dishes, which is <clears throat> never. I, I, I can't. It's gonna, they're not going to ever put the dishwasher in the way I want them to. As much as I want to control them using one towel for at least two days, I'm going to get a lot of gray hair when they want to use a towel for their head, a towel for the body, and a towel for the floor. And yes, I, there's discipline that we have to teach our children. And, and the reason why parents discipline their kids, it's not for power. It's not for control. It's so that they can grow up and have self-discipline themselves. That's why we discipline our kids. That's why we train our kids. So because they are our kids, but they are God's kids forever, we are stewards. And we are to help train them to be responsible adults that love Jesus as Christian parents. That is our responsibility. But we're going to find ourselves miserable if we're always trying to control the people at our work, our spouses, our best friends. We're going to find ourselves miserable. But if you take that effort and that energy that you're giving to control people that you can't control and you turn it towards yourself, you're going to see results. Ooh, y'all quiet up in this Presbyterian church today. Come on, somebody. Who wants to see results? I want to see results. I need to focus my self-control. The third, uh, um, so this word could be uh, translated as restraint, moderation. Ooh, don't y'all love that word, moderation? No. <laughs> Discipline, balance, temperance, or self-control. A self-controlled person maintains a life of moderation and control. I want to take some time to compare two Old Testament people and learn from their life and how they operated in self-control or the lack thereof. 
So we're going to compare both Samson and Joseph, and we're going to learn from them, okay? So we're going back to the Old Testament because these things were written so that we can learn and grow from their victories as well as their mistakes. Amen? So Samson and Joseph, that's one, one thing I saw right away that, that they had in common is they both came from barren women. Uh, we could, isn't that interesting? Let's read here. We're going to go into Judges 13, 1 through 5. I'm going to read about the birth of Samson. It says, again, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord, so the Lord delivered them into the hands of the Philistines for 40 years. A certain man of Zerorah named Manorah from the clan of the Danites had a, a wife who was childless, unable to give birth. The angel of the Lord appeared to her and said, you are barren and childless, but you are going to become pregnant and give birth to a son. Now see to it that you drink no wine or other fermented drink and that you do not eat anything unclean. You will become pregnant and have a son whose head is never to be touched by a razor because the boy will be a Nazarite dedicated to God from the womb. He will take the lead in delivering Israel from the hands of the Philistines. So. This woman, Menorah's wife, was barren and had an angel appear to her and said, you're going to give birth. That's pretty powerful. There's only a few instance, incidents like that that we can see in the Bible where an angel appeared to someone and said, you're going to give birth. M Mary, the mother of Jesus, being one of them. Only a few that you can count in the Bible had an angel literally appear to them. Okay? Here we see uh, this situation was a little bit di different, but in Genesis 30, Verse 1, we can see where Rachel was at. That's Joseph's mom and how she also was barren. It says, when Rachel saw that she was not barren children, children to Jacob, she became jealous of her sister and said to Jacob, give me children lest I die. I have a message just on that verse just that, that it has to be for another time. But she also was not unable to have children, and, you know, she was pretty upset about that. And then we see, moving on in verse 22, it said, God remembered Rachel. He listened to her and enabled her to conceive. She became pregnant and gave birth to a son and said, God has taken away my disgrace. She named him Joseph and said, may the Lord add to me another son. Now, why is this important, talking about self-control, talking about both Joseph and Samson? Why is it important to note that both of their, their, their mothers could not have children for, and could not conceive for a very long time? One, because I believe self-control comes from a place of emptiness often. It comes from a place where we are, are just at our wits end. We are desperate. We have tried everything else, and we realize, God, we need temperance in our life. Oftentimes, before we really see change, we have to have pain. Come on, somebody. Uh, oftentimes, we won't change until the pain of remaining the same outweighs the pain of change. And so here these women are desperate in a place of wanting a child, and God gives them a child. Oftentimes, we got to get to that place that we are like, you know what? I give up trying to control everybody else, every other situation, and I'm ready to have the pain of self discipline in my life, of temperance in my life. So I, I found that to be interesting. I also find that it's interesting that both Joseph and Samson were ordained from birth. They were called from birth, which brings me to my second point. Both Samson and Joseph were called of God. Samson was a Nazarite and dedicated from the very womb. A Nazarite was an Old Testament person, you did not have to be a priest. You did not have to be a prophet to, be, to take a Nazarite vow. Sometimes people would take a Nazarite vow for um, a, a, an extended time, uh, maybe three weeks, a month, a couple months, maybe a year. Sometimes people would be dedicated from the womb as a Nazarite. They were set apart. They didn't drink any kind of alcohol. They, they allowed their, their hair had to grow long. There was uh, things they had to stay away from, like dead um, animals and, and even humans. Um, and there was a sacrifice and an obedience, a calling on their life. And we see this with Samson. Joseph also grew up with a unique ability um, or giftings from God. He was able to interpret dreams, and he had dreams from God at a very young age. 
That is a unique calling and a gift that not very many people have. So both of these men of God were called of God, and both of them were given gifts from God. Samson had supernatural strength. Joseph had the, uh, the gift of, of having dreams and interpreting other people's dreams. Both, were sa both saved their peop the people that they were called to. They both brought deliverance and salvation to, to people. They were both deliverers called by God. Very interesting. Very, very interesting. However, both Samson and Joseph had to deal with their character. Hmm. This is a hard one. The reason why this is a hard one is because dealing with character is not easy. And the lack of discernment in the American church sometimes makes me like throw up a little bit in my mouth. Like seriously, we care more about what things look like and giftings and anointing than character. And that is a very dangerous place to be. And so I want to encourage you. <laughs> Hi, buddy. I want to encourage you to focus on character because character matters. It matters to God. It matters to the church. It matters to the world. Now, let me tell you the reason why we see some of our, uh, we don't see what we should see in the church today is because a lot of people in the world are judging not the gifts, the talent, the anointing, but the character of the people of God. Who was it, Gandhi, who said um, that after he studied religions that he, that, that Jesus was the one who spoke to him the most, but he loved, he, he loved to follow Jesus, but he didn't understand the followers of Jesus. I'm probably totally messing up that quote, but <laughs> close enough to say oftentimes it's not Jesus that the world has a problem with. It is the people that claim Jesus that don't live like Jesus. Amen. Of course, the world does have a problem with Jesus, too, if we get right down to it. But you see, my drift here is that character matters. It matters, I would say, more than charisma by far. It matters more than your giftings or your talents by far. I would say after character, the, the, the closest thing that's going to help you get far in life is competence. We do need to study to show ourselves approved. We need to know what we're doing and what we're talking about. But character is so important that, that, that Paul said after he preached to others that he wanted to make sure that he did not disqualify himself from the prize. What's that mean? That means that you could be anointed by God. You could preach the best messages. You could, you could have the most understanding of even the Bible and yet be disqualified from even entering heaven because of your lack of allowing the word of God to actually change you. Character. That's deep, y'all. That's deep. I mean, isn't one of the scariest verses in the Bible that I prophesied in your name and I, I did all these things in your name and then the, the Bible says, yet I did not know you because it's not about what you do, it's about actually having an intimacy with God. And when God knows you, your character changes. Notice that verse is like, didn't I prophesy in your name? Didn't I cast out demons in your name? What was that focus on? It, it, it was focused on me. And it was focused on anointing and giftings and talents. He wasn't like, God, didn't I like operate in self-control? Didn't I love others? Didn't I walk in kindness and gentleness? It wasn't the fruit of the spirit he was talking about. It was the gifts of the spirit he was talking about. And so you could have the gifts of the spirit, but if you don't have the fruit of the spirit with the gifts of the spirit, then you're still missing the, the, the intimacy that you need in, to enter into eternal life. I mean... To really know Jesus. Matter of fact, the Bible says that even demons know who Jesus are and they tremble. So just knowing about God and who he is, that doesn't, that doesn't mean anything if you don't allow the word of God, the gospel, to actually change you. Come on, somebody. Do you get this? Character matters. So these Old Testament men, this is where they differ. Samson and Joseph dealt with their character flaws very differently. They both were tested. However, only one passed. 
I don't know if you remember a few, uh, maybe a month ago when I preached, I talked about how faith that's not tested cannot be trusted. So both of these men of God were tested, but only one came out refined. See, Samson vowed never to cut his hair as a part of a vow that he took as a Nazarite. But when it, when, it got, when it got down to it, when he was in a bed with a woman who was not his wife, he fell into temptation and she cut his hair and he lost the strength and the power and the anointing that God gave him. Because his character, he didn't deal with his character. And we saw character flaws in Samson way before he was ever in the bed with Delilah, how he treated his first wife, the way that the, 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 the little compromises that he made in his life. He wasn't supposed to be, you know, drinking. He wasn't supposed to be around dead things, and yet he, he was. And so those little compromises finally got to that big place in his life that he just, he, he lost it. And the Bible says that he went out to fight the enemy of God, thinking he had the strength that he had before, not even realizing that the, the spirit of the Lord had left him. How often does that happen? And some of you guys have seen this. Some of you guys have been around enough that you have seen people that you respected as people of God let compromises into their life that they have fallen away from the Lord. And, and, and honestly, if we open our eyes, we can see that. We can see that in the world we live because we're not disciplined. We, <laughs> okay, I'm going to say this, and I say this with love and respect, and this is, honestly, this is not against anybody, okay? But this is just an observation that I have seen. We in America have lost our reverence and our, our, what is it? We've lost, we've lost like the, I got to go to church, right? We've lost that. It used to be when, when 20 years ago, when we, when we first started pastoring, it was, and this is not to put no one down, okay? I'm just bringing awareness so that we can realize this is a scheme in it, of, of the enemy because the Bible says that do not neglect meeting together, okay? And I understand sometimes you got to work. I understand sometimes you have vacations and different things, okay? I'm, I'm, again, I'm not thinking of one person. I'm seeing this as a movement. I have the ability to, to look out, especially in some of the positions and seats that I sit in, and see the broader church. So I'm not talking just about our church, but if this applies to you, you can, you can log it away and say, okay, let me grow from it. We put in self-discipline. For instance, if it rains, we're not going to stay home from work on Monday morning. We're going to go to work. <laughs> but if it rains at, at church, and I'm not talking about anyone today because it rained. But as I was driving in and it was pouring down rain, I looked to my kids and said, well, Attendance today is going to be low because it's raining. And in America, anytime it rains or snows or anything like that, I understand if it's dangerous, we got to be careful. I understand. I said, but, you know, we, we see, like, I, we get the magazine Voices of the Martyrs, and, and we, can, we can see people walking through jungles with leashes on them to get to church, right? In Jamaica, when, it's, when they're not facing that kind of persecution, but they're still, like, uh, got to get to church, uh, they come out of the villages at 100-degree weather to get to church. But in America, we don't prioritize it anymore. And it shows what you prioritize. It shows something about what matters in your life. Amen. So we've got to, we've got to get awareness of what is going on. And so here, Samson did not have awareness that he had lost the anointing of God on his life. He went out to fight the enemy as he had done before, not even realizing that the power of God was no longer on him like before friends we have got to change we have got we have got to once again say i need self-control in my life so joseph different than samson but also was tested he was tested in, in ways that in in some ways i think was even harder than what samson went through samson was tested by his own desires his own flesh his own lust he he fell into sin with delilah however Joseph was tested by his own family. He was sold into slavery by his own brothers. By his own brothers. Some of the hardest tests we go through is when our own family looks at us and does not believe what God is doing in our life. They don't back us up. I'm, I'm grateful I have a family that backs me up. I'm grateful that I have a family that believes in the anointing of God. And even when things look crazy and aren't going as I had hoped they would go, they have my back. But many of us grow up in families that don't, they're the ones cursing us. They're the ones speaking word curses over our lives. And here's Joseph, just like that. Just like that. I remember one time I, I had taught, I think it was our youth years ago, 
that often we have to guard ourselves because what we hate, if we're not careful to fight against it, is what we become. You see so many young boys in inner city ministry growing up, having a, working through a hatred towards their father for abandoning them. And then they become men, and, and it's the temptation to abandon their own uh, their own children. I remember when we had kids, my husband was so fearful, and so was I in different ways, um, to become a father because of the example that his father said. And so often he'll say things like silly things. We were just at the game, and I can't remember what we were talking about, something with the kids. And he was like, well, my dad never did, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, bro, you can't use that. As, you can't. You, you, Look to my dad, okay, if you want to be him, like, stop. And not, not, and we love, we love Tim Hester and pray for, for him, uh, and, and, and there's no bitterness there. But this is the thing. Often we can become what we despise in our own family because Jesus may live in your heart, but grandpa lives in your bones. Come on, somebody. DNA is strong. It is strong. And, and we have to fight against generational sin. So Joseph was sold into slavery by his own brothers. He was put into a, a foreign country and a place that he, he did not have connections or understanding uh, of culture. And then again, he was falsely accused by Potiphar's wife, was tempted with lust, just like Samson was, except for he did what the Bible says. When you're dealing with lust, this is both men and women. When you deal with lust and lust is at your doorstep, you cannot play with lust. You cannot make lust a pet. Oh, little pet lust, that's okay. We'll just look a little bit. It's going to be fine. I'm going to use some self-control and just glance 15 minutes a day. No. Lust is a monster. It will eat you up. It will consume your life. The Bible says flee from lust. Oh, see, and I wasn't in here. So Joseph ran from lust. That's what we're supposed to do. We can't, we can't, we can't let in that little compromise, the little foxes that, that ruin the vine. We have to shut the door in that area of our life because otherwise it will consume you like it did Samson. But Joseph, he learned character through the things that he was tested. Sometimes we have to literally flee from temptation because when we do, it builds our character, and eventually we will be promoted. But it's hard. It is not easy. Faith that is not tested cannot be trusted. Character that is not tested cannot be trusted. Character that's not tested is not even character, because how do you know you've never been tested? So often we look at other people and say, well, if I was in that situation, I would do it this way. You don't know because you weren't in that situation. <laughs> so e it's so easy to look at someone and judge them and say, well, you should have done it this way, this, you know. And we do it even when we're watching a movie, like, you idiot, do this. But we don't know. <laughs> we don't know because we are not in those shoes. Empathy is when we learn to place ourselves in someone else's shoes and have a little bit more compassion, okay? And we need to pray because the Bible says, be careful for those who think they stand lest they fall. Come on, somebody. Is anyone besides Aunt Margaret feeling me today? Come on. We got to get it together. We need character in the house of God again. We need character in our leadership again. We need character in ourselves again. Amen. So both Samson and Joseph had to deal with their character. Samson lacked self-control, whereas Joseph walked in self-control. Uh, I remember before I knew, knew that self-control and temperance were basically the same thing, when I first um, came to the Lord and I really, really sold out, really gave him everything, about 19 years of age, the Lord put that word temperance on my heart. And, and he had me pray for temperance in my own life. And I'm like, why? When I look back now, these many years later, I look back and say, the reason I prayed for such a long time for temperance in my life is because I'm very passionate. Like, I just don't do things halfway. I'm going back to school, and B's are not good enough for me. I, I want A's because I'm, I'm too old to go back to just get C's that get degrees. Now, if I was 20, that's no big deal, but that's just how I am. If I do something, I really want to do it right. I've learned I can't put that on other people, though. But for myself, that's how I am. But I have learned through temperance that sometimes it's okay to get a B if I try my best. Sometimes 
it's okay if things don't look perfect, if things aren't super polished. Sometimes it's okay to let the Holy Spirit speak to you and you share an illustration that you don't have in your notes because the Holy Spirit speak it, right? Because it's not about me having to control everything and everything having to be perfect. It's about allowing me as an imperfect vessel to allow the Holy Spirit to move through me, amen? And that's the same for all of us. That's what temperance is. It is moderation. It is learning to tell yourself no. write that down in my notes if I ever preach this message again I'm gonna pretend it came from me yes Lord that's good <laughs> did you hear that you all I'm gonna say it again for those who might be watching online so here we are talking about self-discipline and self-control and Samson's lack of self-control led him into slavery because eventually his hair was cut and then the Philistines got him he was blinded they took his eyes out cut his hair and he became a slave finally at the end of his life he prayed his hair grew a little bit he prayed said God give me some more strength boom he like knocked down pillars and the enemies were destroyed however what happened with Joseph was the complete opposite. He went into slavery, learned self-control, and then was freed from slavery. He became the second in, the, uh, in, in Egypt and delivered the people of God. Come on, friends. That's what self-control can do. It can either, if you learn it, it can free you. If you don't, you will be bound. Right? We need that so good, babe. That is amazing to see married to a man of God right here. Samson's lack of self-control, whereas Joseph walked in self-control. Samson lacked it. Joseph walked in it. A lack of self-control destroys potential in a person with great power and influence. It destroys the potential. Where self-control, it develops potential. Because self-control, another, another thing from self-control is it develops self-discipline. If we learn self-control, we learn to control our impulses, our urges, our, our wanting to go off on somebody, our wanting to assume things about people. You know, if we learn to control that, we learn to control our appetites, our lusts, those things are natural. They will come. We live in a falling world. But when we learn to control that, it will free us and will give us promotion in our life. We have to develop self-control so we can develop self-discipline in our own lives. The Spirit of God does not give us a spirit of fear, right, but of power and self-discipline or self-control, and we need that in our life. I want to share one more thing with you um, before, I, before I, I, I finish this up. We need self-control, which requires both a life of self-discipline and a life that is spirit driven. So often when we talk about self-control, we put the emphasis on self. We forget that it is in the section of the Bible that's talking about the fruit of the spirit. So even self-control can't be conjured up with power, willpower. It has to be submitted to the spirit of God so that he can enable us to be temperate, to be self-disciplined. And with self-control, self-discipline goes so strongly with it. That is why when I don't feel like reading my Bible, because I woke up late, the dog peed on my bed. Literally. Literally. Foul dog. <laughs> I still have to read it. That's why when I'm, I'm trying to use restraint in what I eat, and somebody brings out the most beautiful birthday cake I've ever seen in my life, <laughs> I have to use restraint because I already made a commitment. I wasn't going to touch that until Christmas time. Lord, help me. Right? We have to do things that we don't want to do because it, it produces self-control and self-discipline in our life. And we can't do some of the things we want to do because it also produces self-control and self-discipline in our life. So I'm going to end with this verse. To have self-control, we must be spirit-controlled. Titus 2, 11 and, and 13. For the grace of God appeal appeared that offers salvation to all people. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age while we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of the great God and Savior, Jesus Christ.
Would you guys stand to your feet with me? Jesus, you are worthy and you are good. You are worthy and you are good. Friends, I, I want you to take some time right now. I want you to quiet yourself. And I want you to ask the Lord to give you a couple, just two would be good, of goals that you could place in your life to help develop self-control because it's not going to happen by accident. You're going to have to be intentional. And so just like we have to be intentional when we're trying to lose weight or build muscle or go, you know, learn a new craft or a hobby or school or work, we have to be intentional. We have to be intentional with our spirit life. And oftentimes our spirit life is the thing that we say, oh, well, saved by grace. So I'm just going to let, let it all go. And, and God still loves me. And that's that God does love you. You are saved by grace, but grace is the power to say no to ungodliness. And so would you just take some time right now with your eyes closed? Let's ask the Lord, what's in our life, Lord, that we need some more self-discipline, some more temperance, some more self-control. What's an area that I can do? What's one thing I can do to develop self-control? self-discipline in my life. Maybe that's, that's saying I'm going to wake up at a certain time, I have an appointment with God and I'm going to pray. Or I'm going to make sure before I go to bed every night, I'm going to make this an appointment with God. I'm put, I will even put it in my calendar, set some reminders that this is my appointment with God and I'm going to spend some time praying, journaling, reading my Bible. Maybe some of you are in this place and you haven't read your Bible through ever in a year and you're like, I'm about to start now. I don't care that it's August. We're starting now and we're going to next August and I'm going to read my Bible through in one year. Maybe you've done that before and, you, and God is saying, I want you to go deeper and you're going to do deep word studies or, or studies on certain Bibles and you're, and you're going to spend even more time than 15 minutes a day in your word. Maybe it's the Lord saying, you know what? I need to make a more, a better commitment of going to church on a regular basis and bringing people with me or sharing about it. Maybe you know there's some inner healing, some deliverance that you need to do, and you're, and you're gonna make the effort. I have a teacher that says prayer, deliverance, uh, therapy, fasting. We need it all. You have got to put the work in. It's not gonna happen by accident. You've got to be intentional.